So that's what's going on. Well, we're so excited today to have uh, with us all the way from the horrible weather of San Diego, uh, California. I've been told it's one of the nicest places on the planet as far as weather is concerned. And so we, I really appreciate people sacrificing. Uh, Jared and his, uh, Jared, I'm sorry, Brian and his wife, Kristen, is here today. He's got a brother named Jared. That's why I keep messing it up. And uh, they're here all the way from San Diego. And uh, Brian was a music director at Christ for the Nations. It was one of the premier worship schools in the, in the world, really. And just has written a number of tunes that have been recorded by different worship artists and things of that nature. Has even recorded some of his own. But more importantly than that, he's a lover of God and a lover of, of, of people. And that's what it's really all about. And it's just such a great thing to have him come. I met him through our friend David Ferranti and met him last year uh, at a conference. And we hit it off and we talked. And I like him because he's a real guy. I like people that are real. They have no pretense and no religious you know, stuff like that. You're just, just being who they are. It's just so refreshing to meet people that are not interested in trying to be something they're not, but just being real with themselves and real with other people and real with God. So that's what he is. He's a wonderful man of God. Would you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church? He's led worship already. Brian Ming. Well, it's good to be with you this morning, and I appreciate uh, Pastor Eric allowing me to uh, share the word with you. And uh, we are kind of in a new uh, stage of our ministry. We have spent the last five years uh, planting a church uh, in San Diego and um, left kind of the worship world and uh, went to obey the, the call of God and plant a church. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for pastors now that I've been one. And uh, uh, But we are actually entering a new phase about a year and a half ago. The Lord spoke to me, and he told me to start writing again. And uh, that he was very much not done with me in the area of worship, but he kind of needed to set me on the side for a little while and develop some things, work on some things in me. And uh, so a year and a half ago, he said, start writing. I'm going to give you the opportunity to record. And I hadn't recorded or put anything out in a number of years, probably five years. And uh, I started writing, and it just was like a river of living water just flowing out of me. I'd write several songs a day, and I just began to uh, uh, pin my heart. And lo and behold, about six months later, a church uh, from Dallas that I used to be in relationship with and have still been dear friends, but uh, we've kept in contact. They flew me out. And they had come into some money, uh, sold a building, and wanted to invest in some different ministries. And uh, so that pastor, Pastor Mark Brand, um, we were sitting around the table with several missionaries, and he told me, he said, uh, present what you feel like God is telling you and uh, that you would like to uh, us to finance. And so I needed money for living. I needed money for to pay the electric bill and to do outreach and uh, things for the church, and the only thing that kept coming to my spirit was what God spoke to me uh, several months earlier, start writing, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, re to record, and uh, so I told them about what God had said, and uh, they gave, uh, flew out to San Diego, gave us a wonderful uh, offering to uh, several thousand dollars to record an album, and actually that album is um, available in the back, let me do my quick commercial, this is okay, quick commercial? Um, we have some products out there. Um, this one's called Freedom Project. It's the newest project. Uh, we've actually, uh, several integrity artists have, are looking at some of these songs. Um, uh, I also have a prophetic album. Here's the thing. Um, how many know that what you receive on Sundays is not adequate to sustain you all week long? You need something uh, all week. And... And w when God asked me to do these projects, every single one of them, not only has uh, he paid for them, but they have served a specific purpose. I know that this broken once again, the song that we, uh, or the song that we sang, I will rejoice, I will rejoice. We recorded this on, the, on this album uh, right before I left CFNI, and people, uh, I get uh, um, reports back all the time that they'll be driving in their car and discouraged and they'll put that song on. And the Bible calls it this. He said, he will give you, uh, in the midst of your situation, he'll give you what's called a song of deliverance. Have you ever been going through something and all of a sudden you hear a song and your spirit is automatically lifted? He will give you songs in the midnight hour. 
Paul and Silas, singing in the jail, and they were freed. Um, so these projects are not just, you know, money makers. I will say that all of the, all of the proceeds from, this, uh, uh, from these projects go to feed starving children. Their names are Brianne, Caitlin, Tyler, <laughs> age 20, 16, and 13. So they're back in San Diego. So um, and pick those up, and I believe they'll be a blessing to you. Um, did you guys hear about what happened in San Diego? About the guy that was throwing bricks off the overpass? Did you guys hear about that? Crazy, crazy story. Right there in Oceanside. Somebody was on the overpass, and he had, a, he had a, a bricks, and he was tying bricks, and, and he tied it around his arm, and he threw it down, and it actually went through somebody's windshield. Did you hear about this? Crazy. And the crazy thing is this, that when it, it smashed through the windshield, it actually tore the guy's arm off. Isn't that crazy? Are you glad you came to church to be you know, edified this morning? But here's the crazy thing. They actually convicted the person in the car. They went to jail for armed robbery. Can you believe that? <laughs> ba -ba -psh, yeah. I'll be here all day. <laughs> when I left San Diego, it was 72 degrees. Just a little different when I arrived in Connecticut. But uh, I love the snow. In fact, I wrote a wrote a book recently, released at Christmas, and uh, um, it's called Snow Sometimes Falls, and uh, I felt like, what a fitting place to come right after I released that book, Snow Sometimes Falls. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the topic of Thanksgiving, and the title of my message is Thanks in Everything, and I know it's not Thanksgiving, but uh, as a worship leader, I feel like that this is a message that God has given me, a very important message to the body of Christ. And uh, when I was uh, 22 years old, uh, my wife and I had been married a couple years. We lived uh, with her parents for a few years. And uh, we, while I finished school, I was um, saving, working, and we did, had a little nest egg built up. And uh, she had a desire, and she told me this. She said, babe, she said, when we move out of my parents' house, and you graduate from college, and you get your big high-paying job, and, you know, uh, we start r rolling in the dough, um, we're going to move right out of here into our very own house. Own a house. So I kept talking to her night after, and I'm like, are you sure that we need to, you know, buy a house? I mean, you know, apartments aren't bad, and, you know, it's a lot cheaper. And she said, nope. She's a little bulldog. I know she's the, only this tall, but she can be feisty. She said, nope. I'm believing that when we leave this house, we're moving in to our own house that we own. I said, okay, I'm believing with you. I didn't tell her that I had my doubts, but I, I just decided that I was going to side with her. That summer, we had a special speaker that came to our church, and as well, um, I took on a new job as a worship leader at my dad's church. Uh, it wasn't a very large church, but um, I was the first full-time staff member that he put on. And uh, we weren't making, we weren't rolling in the dough. We were making just enough to kind of to survive. But this man of God, he was standing uh, up on the pulpit. He stopped his sermon, and he called me and my wife out. And he said, I want to just share something I believe the Lord's telling me. And he gave this prophetic word. He said, you're going to have a dwelling place. God has heard your cry. He's heard your prayer for a dwelling place. And then before he, he stopped giving this word, he, he, he almost paused like he was done, but then he stopped and he said, in fact, God wants you to know that it's already in the making as I speak. And then he, we sat down and he went on with the sermon. He didn't know that the very next day I had made an appointment with a, a realtor or a, a lender to see what we could qualify for. And we sat across the desk and um, he asked me to prepare all my figures, and I got all my, you know, my finances together, and I took the paper, I turned it around, and I put it right in front of him, and he laughed and laughed and laughed, and, and he basically said, you, you, you don't know, you don't make enough. There, there, there's no way. I mean, you're not even close. And I was like, oh, and our hearts sank. But then he said, but, it, you know, if you don't mind to live about 10 minutes away in this other city, I know of this program 
that uh, is running for first-time home buyers, and they make your deposit for you. Um, it's a really great program. And um, if you're interested, we can go look at some houses, and I think I can get you qualified for that. Are you interested? And my wife just perked up, and she said, am I interested? She said, if I had anywhere I wanted to live, actually that community is where I'd want to live. So we, the very next day after we got this prophetic word, we went to this community, we put down $500 to reserve our lot, and we actually qualified for um, a house to buy. But we made one mistake. We were walking through the model houses, and the, our first house was a, a, a really, really huge uh, 1,050 square feet, three bedrooms, two baths. And, uh, but we made a mistake. We're walking through that house and like, this is really cool. But we walked through the model house that was just a little bit bigger, the, the floor plan just a little bit bigger. And my wife walked in and she said, this would be perfect. I know we don't qualify for this, but this would be perfect. It's a little bit bigger. It has vaulted ceilings. It had a, 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 a wood flooring walkway when you walked in. And she said, oh, this is really nice. I'm like, babe, we're getting a house. Just just be happy with that. She's like, I know, I know, I know. But this, this, was, I mean, this one's really nice. That was Monday. On Thursday, we got a call from the realtor. And he said, you'll never guess what happened. We had someone back out of a house. And we don't have a buyer for it. I've already talked to your lender. And I think that I can stretch your money. It's the house that's just bigger than the one that you're, you reserved but I think we can make it work. Are you interested? I said, no. No, I'm just kidding. I said, <laughs> let me check with my wife. Yes, okay, we are interested. So later that week, we actually went to the house. It was just at the stage before all the colors and the, the, uh, the wood floors were picked out. We got a free fireplace. We got a free electrical package, double the outlets in the whole house. And... It was just amazing. We went back and we listened to that prophetic word that we got, and here's what it said. God is going to give you a dwelling place, and it's already in the making as I speak. Six weeks later, we walked into our brand new house. God is good. Isn't that a cool story? <clears throat> that was almost 20 years ago, and I'll never forget, it was right around Thanksgiving time. And about a week before Thanksgiving, I'm sitting in my new house. I had bought one couch, and I had a card table and a few beds. That's all I had. Um, and we're, I'm sitting there, and I'm just beaming from ear to ear. I can't believe how God has blessed us. And my wife was in the back. She was doing something in the, in the back bedroom. And, and I'm just sitting there. And out of nowhere, I hear God's voice. Not audibly, but I heard him as clear as day. He asked me a question. He said, are you thankful? My automatic response was, well, of course I'm thankful. How many know that when God asks you a question, it's not because he wants information? Adam, Eve, where are you? Do we really think that God didn't know that they were hiding behind the bush over there? He was trying to get them to come out from hiding and expose what was really going on in their heart. He asked me again. He said, are you thankful? And I stood up and I said, you know what, God? I am thankful. And I just began to praise the Lord loudly. I said, thank you, God. For this house, thank you for giving this. And before long, I was jumping, I was dancing. I was like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. My wife walks in, she's like. And I'm like, I'm thanking God. She's like, and she starts thanking God with me. And we're jumping around, we're dancing and doing. I'm like, thank you, God. And I look out the window and there's neighbors walking by and they're like. <laughs> I'm like, just thanking God. And I'll never forget, I sat down after we had just rejoiced before the Lord, and I just, I felt that God smile at me. And he, uh, he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, most people are not thankful for what I give them, so why should I bless them with more? 
And some of you might think that, that, that that's not even scriptural. And, and you know, I, I don't think there's a verse that exactly says that. But from that day on, I made it a point in my life that I was going to be thankful for everything. Because I believe that it is, it is, It is the thing, I believe. Have you ever received a gift from somebody and they weren't thankful? You open the box and they look at it and like, oh. How do you feel? It's like, I took time to buy that. Here, I'm going to take it back. Can you imagine not being thankful for something that God did for you? Well, there's a curious story in the Bible. It's out of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 17. If you want to grab your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhones, uh, it'll, it'll also come up on the screen. This is a very famous story, and I'm sure that you probably have heard it a time or two, but I want to use this story in context of what I'm talking about. Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 17 says this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a different distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. What a curious story. My brother taught me a long time ago, my oldest brother, both my brothers are pastors. He told me, he said, Brian, he said, those who preach the best sermons learn how to ask the best questions. He said, ask questions. So I do. When I read stories, I, many times I'll kind of pick it apart and I'll say, God, what are you trying to say? I, I think we can all relate to the subject of leprosy. How many of you have ever been sick before? How many of you have ever had leprosy before? Nobody. How many of you have ever had spiritual leprosy? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. An outcast. Sin separates us from God. We've all been sick from God. God has separated himself because we've all been sick. We've all fallen short but then Jesus comes by. And here's the thing about lepers. When you found out you had leprosy, it was, it was a daunting uh, thing that the doctors would tell you. You go show yourself to the priest. When they confirmed it, they actually said, you are now banished. You cannot live with family. You cannot even live in the city. In fact, you have to go live in a special community by yourself away from society. Because there's no chance. We don't want anybody coming close to you with, the, with the, even the chance of getting infected with this disease. In fact, many people believe lepers were sinners. But there was 10 lepers. Maybe in their camp, somebody came back and they heard a report. Did you hear about this guy, Jesus? This, this guy is amazing. Have you heard that he actually touched a leper and he was healed? Did you hear about the, the blind man that couldn't see, that he touched and he could see again? This guy is amazing. If we have a chance here. And these outcasts of society, they did something exactly what they needed to do in order to receive their healing. They came close to town, too close to town, and they called out when Jesus passed by, Jesus, Jesus, have pity on us. Don't you see us over here? We're dying over here. Come on, help us. 
Bible says that Jesus responds immediately. He says, go, show yourself to the priests. And we can all relate to this, right? We were all sinners. We were all sick. But Jesus came along and praise God. Jesus spoke to us and said, go, you are better. You are made clean. I've covered you. I've made your sins as far as the east is from the west cleansed. We can respond to that. But that's not why this story is in the Bible. That's not why this story is, is here for our reading. It's not as much about the miracle as it's what happens after the miracle. And that's what I find with Christians. That's what I find with believers. Many times we respond to the gospel. We get it. We understand the healing. We understand the grace. We understand the forgiveness. We welcome that. Yes, God, you are so good. But what comes after that? Well, the Bible says that nine of them ran off never to return, but one guy stops and he turns back. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm missing something here. And he walks back to Jesus. He throws himself at his feet and he says, I just needed to come back and thank you. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for, for, for the life that you gave me back. Here's Jesus' response. Where are the other nine? Did I not heal ten lepers and only one returns? Where are the other nine? I believe that God is wondering even today, where are the other nine? Did I not send my son, to heal them all. Where are the other nine? If you look at it from a statistical standpoint, perhaps this story is in the Bible as a warning to us, saying that nine out of ten, 90% perhaps are not as thankful as they need to be. Point number one of my sermon is this. Jesus expects thankfulness. Can you read between the lines when Jesus said, where are the other nine? Has, have they all run off and gotten involved in their busy lives? And here's the crazy thing. They were doing exactly what Jesus said. We can be busy doing exactly all the religious things. They walked right back to the church and showed themselves to the priest. They went through all the laws and all the procedures to be cleansed and back into society. And yet Jesus said, why didn't they come back and at least say thank you? Jesus expected them to come back and at least say thanks. Don't you realize that they missed an opportunity not just to be healed. They missed an opportunity to be in relationship with the king of all kings, the king of the universe, the son of God who spoke the stars into the sky, created everything that we know, as the, that we see all around us. The same God, they had the opportunity to meet God's son and look at him eyeball to eyeball. And because of the busyness, because of the excitement of going back to their busy lives, they miss the Messiah. Jesus expects us to be thankful. It's just like when I'm sitting in my house. Are you thankful? Are you thankful? Why is this such a big deal? What's so important about thanks, Thanksgiving? Maybe like, Brian, you're just talking about one thing. Thanks is just one facet of Christianity. It got real quiet in here. I hope that, I hope that our hearts are open. I'm telling you, I, 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 I will come around many times and God will challenge me on this account. Are you thankful not just for the good things, but how about the bad things? I know it's easy to be thankful for the good things, but how about the struggles? Count it all joy when you suffer trials and tribulations of all kind. Count it all joy? 
Come again? What? What are you talking about? Why is this such a big deal? Why thanks? Why is this important? As a worship leader, I probably, one of the first things I ever learned as being a worship leader, one of the most important, kind of the, the basic theology to uh, being a, a worship leader and leading people into the presence of God is this. Maybe you've heard the scripture, Psalms 100, verse 4. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Anybody heard that song? Remember the Boom Chick songs? I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Just love it. You, you got to get your country twang on. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Man, those were big time songs back in the day. Now they're funny. Those were cutting edge, man. Like, get that drum beat going. <laughs> but do you know what this psalm is saying? This is basic theology. Theology 101. I will enter his gates with what? I will enter his courts with... In the Old Testament, there was a very specific journey to getting into God's presence. The gate was called thanksgiving. The court was called praise. There was an outer court that you had to enter into. There was an inner court. And then there was a most holy place where God's presence truly sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, this one specific spot called the mercy seat. It was God's presence, tangible presence. People would come from miles around to the temple. Right when you walked into the, to the outer courts, the first thing that you ran into was this, this brazen altar where you laid down an, a, a sacrifice and it was burned up. But even before that, this is what it says. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. Here's the point. The doorway to the presence of God, to just getting in the door. You ever wanted to get into the door somewhere and you're an outsider looking in? I just wish that I could be a part of that group. Just wish. But man, there's a bouncer there and there's a, some a big dude and he won't let me in. I just want to get in. But the door is blocked. You know what the key to the door, to open the door, to get into the presence of God is? Thanksgiving. Some of you might be wondering, it seems like lately that I can't find his presence. It seems like everywhere I go, I even go into church sometimes. It, it, it always, it never ceases to amaze me. How that I could be in a service and God can be moving and pouring out His Spirit and things are happening and the Word of God is coming forward. And I'll walk outside and I'll talk to one person they'll be like, I didn't feel God at all. Then I'll walk to the next person and they'll say, man, did you feel that? Wow, God was everywhere. It's amazing. Isn't it amazing how the condition of our heart, the thankfulness meter many times dictates how much we are able to receive and encounter the presence of God. Job said it this way. He said, I go to the north, and I can't find him. I go to the south, the east, the west. Everywhere I look, I cannot find God. Then he goes on to say, he said, but the important thing is not that I know where he is, but that he knows where I am. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever wondered, why does it seem like everybody else is getting so much from God, but I feel like an outsider? Just maybe, just maybe consider, have you lost the thankfulness in your heart? Here's kind of the progression. Num point number two is this. 
Thanks and praise is the gateway to God's presence. It kind of works like this. You walk into a church, never been there before, and maybe you walked into this church the first time you came. Maybe you're here the first time today. And you, you look around and you're like, these are some nice people. Man, what a great place. Look at this building. Wow. This is a nice building. Do you guys like the new building? Is it, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I go a lot of places, minister a lot of places. This is really state of the art. This is beautiful. And we walk in and we look around and we say, wow, this is amazing. And you hear Pastor Eric up here preaching. You hear uh, the worship team playing. It's like, wow, they're awesome. Oh, this is amazing. Thank you, God. I found my new church. Thank you. We're so thankful. Until about six months later, pastor walks right by you and doesn't shake your hand. I don't even think he likes me. We used to be tight. But now he doesn't even talk to me. And everybody seems like it, there's clicks there, you know? I don't fit. Where do I? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And before long, we become very familiar, not just with the good things, not just the good, but we also learn about pastor's weaknesses, the leadership's weaknesses. Well, that church is good, but, you know, they're not good at that. Before long, we could become very familiar. You know what I see? I see this is, this is the number one reason that marriages fail. Man, God, thank you for this beautiful, beautiful woman you blessed me with. And then you're married a year. Oh, God, what did you do? What did I get in myself into? Before, we were so thankful. Oh, God, you've answered my prayers. And then before long, we become very familiar, not just with the good things, but also the bad things, right? The things that we don't like. Here's the progression. Are you ready? It goes like this. Thankfulness. When we get saved, thank you, God. Many people liken it to this. It's almost like I felt a thousand pounds of weights. Jesus, forgive me. I can't believe that you died for me. How could you do that? He comes in. Jesus, be my Savior. Feels like a thousand pounds rolls off. Many people describe it like it's the first time they took a real breath. <gasps> wow. <sighs> the air. Can you feel that? It's so clear. I feel so happy. Wow. A life that's free. I don't have chains. I'm actually free. But then after a while, we become familiar with this Christian life. It's difficult. Oh, you mean there's discipleship? The fruit of the Spirit. Oh, I didn't know about any of that. Love, joy, peace, patience. What do you? I have to do what? I thought it was just God's grace and his mercy. He loves us. Oh, how he loves. No, no, no. There's more to Christianity than just his love. That's where many people miss it. And what happens is we were so thankful at the beginning, but then we become very familiar with the things of God. Once we become familiar, many times we become too familiar. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not even sure that I can do this. I'm not even sure that this church is really where I'm supposed to be. We become so familiar, too familiar. We start going to the next stage, the fourth stage, thankfulness, familiar, too familiar. And then all of a sudden, we, we turn a nasty corner and we start taking it for granted. We become resentful. I'm truly convinced that many times we resent the very things that save our necks. The woman that sang up here next to me that God blessed me with, there was times I didn't like her. Because she called me on things. 
she was an absolute godsend. But how many know that when we don't want to deal with those hidden issues and we have somebody telling us about them, the very thing that God has put in our life to help save our bacon, we start resenting it. Pastor, don't, don't, don't preach sermons like that. I'm comfortable here. Don't ask me to give. Don't ask me to forgive those who, those who hurt me. It's easier to just be mad. I like it here. Don't challenge me. And yet the very thing that's saving your bacon, that God is using to speak in your life, to change and challenge and uplift you, to take you from glory to glory, many times we start resenting them. And we lose our thanks. Now, at this point in my life, 20 years later, I look at my wife and I say, man, I didn't even get it. The goodness of God through her. God used that woman to stick by my side even when I wasn't as faithful or doing st stupid stuff or being angry or not parenting like I should or blowing off family time and doing too much ministry. I mean, thank you, God. We go from thankfulness to familiar to too familiar to taking for granted, and all of a sudden, then we lose our thankfulness. There's kind of a snapshot in the Bible of this. Two different scenarios, two different people that we can relate to. I think anybody can relate to this story. It's called the story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, this is son number one. Are you ready? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up. He finally came to his senses. Ha! Oh, I can't believe I ended up here. How did I end up here? And we come back to God. If you would just accept me back. And God the Father says, absolutely. And, you're, and by the way, you're not just going to be a servant. You're going to be a son of mine, a daughter of mine. But then look at the response of the second son who never left the house. Here's the response. Luke 15, verse 29. But he answered his father. He's like, what's going on here? Why is the celebration? Kill the fat of What's going on? He answered his father and he said, Look, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. It goes on to say, And yet this son of yours comes home who's been uh, doing, you know, God knows what, and you throw a party for him? It's almost as if the older son had this mentality it's not fair. Don't I deserve my portion? Don't I deserve more than I'm getting? Don't I deserve more from God? Be careful. Be careful whenever we start adopting that mentality in the church. You owe me, God. I've served you for 42 years. I even worked in the nursery. I hate kids. <laughs> Do you know how many diapers I've changed? And we get this mentality. I really believe that the people that are most in jeopardy of standing before God are those who have been Christians for many, many years, but without even knowing it, they lose their things. And it happens so quickly. We get stagnant so quickly, don't we? It just becomes about going to church. It's the right thing to do. It's just, it's just routine, right? And all of a sudden, if we're not careful, 
the presence of God. That one of the saddest scriptures in the entire Bible is when Saul was out and he was trying to trying to fight the battles but on the Lord's behalf, but there's a scripture that says, the Spirit of God departed from him, but he did not know it. How sad to be doing all the right things. I got this picture that scares the living daylights out of me. I was praying one day, and I saw kind of this picture of people standing before God. I wouldn't say it was a vision, but it was kind of a, a picture of, of life. And I saw people standing before God, and they were saying, God, I did this for you and that for you, and I served in the church. And, of course, we know that this is Scripture. He says, oh, you cast out demons, and you, you, know, you raised the dead and healed the lame. I mean, we're talking some pretty heavy hitters here that did some pretty great exploits. He said, but I never knew you. But many of us will say, but God, come on. And I got this picture of Jesus looking at us and saying, you knew better. And all the excuses at that very moment will fall to the wayside, won't they? But God, I didn't know. And he'll look at us with justice in his voice and truth because he cannot speak lies. And he'll say, you knew better. That issue that you pretended that I wasn't dealing with, you knew better. Stop it. Stop lying to yourself and start dealing with the issue. But at that point, it'll be too late, right? You knew better. How many issues do we have that we just skirt aside, that we just sit in church week after week after week, and we just let them, just let them sit there? No big deal. My pornography problem's not a, it's not a big deal. My little alcohol problem, nobody knows. And these, these little foxes that ruin our life and our thankfulness, and we try to come in and we try to enjoy worship. Oh, God, I just thank you. And yet we have all these issues. You knew better. You knew better. And he's all along trying to get us to that place, and we lose our thankfulness and his presence. I spent a portion of my life. I'm going to peel it open. You guys ready? Transparent preacher. I've been at a point in my life before where I've had hidden issues in my life. Hidden things. And it was crazy because I would even sometimes minister in front of thousands. And I would walk on stage and I would literally feel the anointing of God come upon me. And I knew that there was issue, there was something not right. There was stuff that going on that wasn't right. And I'd walk and I would feel the anointing come upon me and I'd sing and I'd minister. And then it was so sad because the moment that I walked off stage, I could feel it literally lift off of me. And I was like, no. Absent from the presence of God. And yet God had mercy on me. He kept working with me. He will work with you and work with you. But there is a point where enough is enough. Finally, I had to get to the point, I'm like, God, everything, every issue, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Get to the real bottom line issues. Get to the heart issues that, I, that I'm so compelled to hold on to, even though I know they're destroying me. They're destroying my family. They're destroying our relationship. I never knew you. The, the relationship was available, but your own actions kept you from intimacy with me because I cannot dwell where there is sin, even though I paid the ultimate price so you can be free from it all. Is this okay just to share honestly in front of you? I'm just trying to challenge, help some people. I can tell you this, life that is free, truly, truly, truly free is so wonderful. I wrestled for years. Different things would creep in, and I'd give in, and finally I've 
God, take it all. Take everything, every issue. And God is so faithful to free us from every sin, every unrighteousness, every attitude, and living that life justly or um, righteously before him is so wonderful. Point number three is this. God's will is a life of thankfulness. Can I give you a word of prophecy this morning? Anybody uh, okay with a prophetic word? Okay, in fact, this word would be more clear and more on target than if I called you out and called you up and said, thus saith the Lord, da na na and read your mail, and you're like, ah, God knows me. This is more a sure word of prophecy than that. You ready? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. This is the prophetic word for you. Do not be anxious for everything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. You don't have to do that. Don't be worried. Make your request known to God. And here's the word. The God of peace will give you a, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus with a peace that passes understanding. You want to know another prophetic word for you? Here it is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. If, in case you're wondering what the will of God is for you, I have the will of God for you. Thus saith the Lord, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Before anything else, the will of God for you is be thankful in everything. I'll close with this story. When I first moved to San Diego to plant a church, I was really nervous. I was scared. We didn't have a lot of money to work with. We had a word from God, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the church sent us off with a pretty good offering, about 10000 to start. And, but 10000 with uh, 11 people and, you know, launch team, and we all moved into uh, one big house, 11 of us, the Brady Bunch. It was, it, Alice was there and everything. It was crazy. But, you know, it was, um, we, uh, there was a point about six months in, Everybody started getting jobs and, you know, uh, trying to make a living. It's a very expensive place to live. And uh, we got to the point where it was, it was almost, almost, I mean, by the skin, by the, the skin of our teeth, we were making it. And we were working our guts out. I mean, we were just everything we could do. It took us six months to reach our first family. We had several college students that started coming. We reached a few military, you know, uh, people in the military there in, in, in Pendleton and Miramar. And, and so we had maybe 20, 30 people coming at the time. And, and, um, and we were about to starve to death. I, I literally, I was sitting in bed in December, and we had to cut way back on our Christmas presents. We weren't able to get away to our, our anniversary, you know, was in the month of December. And... Um, and I looked over at my wife, and, and she just looked tired. And I said, babe, I said, how are you? She said, I'm cool. I said, well, you know, we're probably not going to be able to get away this year, and we're probably going to have to cut way back. And she said, I know, I know. And we both just kind of put our heads down. And we, it was just kind of one of those deflated bummer moments. You're just like, huh. And I literally had this thought. Maybe you've, you've felt the same thing at times. God. Are you trying to kill me? What are you doing? Why are we here? And I started going through all the scenarios. I said, God, did we miss it? Did we not come at the right time? You know, why, you know, it hasn't, you know, we didn't roll into town and hundreds of people showed up. And I mean, it's been hard, hard work. There's been little money. There's typically in the month of December too, traveling ministers, which is the way I've primarily supported myself at the time, they don't have ministers in at that month. So then things got really cut back. And literally, I had my doubts of even being in the will of God. January 7th, we were in our little warehouse where we were having church. There was about 35 people there. And I was leading worship, and I went into my sermon, and I, 
I gave a very strong altar call. Um, and I just really felt, sometimes you just feel it like God is, God is speaking through you to touch somebody's life. And I said, if you want to give your life to Jesus, I said, just don't wait any longer. Just raise your hand right now. And everybody's heads were bowed and their eyes were closed. And um, except this one guy, Marine, sitting right in the front row on the, on the right side of the stage. And he was looking at me. And he raises his hand and puts it down. And he's just smiling from ear to ear. I was like, thank you. So after the service, I went and I, I just, you know, pat him on the back, shook his hand. I said, Charlie, I said, man, what a great decision you made. He said, yeah, I've been thinking about it for a while, he said. And I finally, you know, talking to some of the Marines and Jeff and the guys and I said, you have a Bible? He said, yeah, they bought me one. And so I've been thinking about it and I finally made a decision. I want to serve Jesus. I'm like, man, that is awesome. He said, but I have a secret, but I don't want to tell you right now. I'm like, Why? He's like, I just don't want to tell you. He said, but I said, well, how about next week? Think about it. Come back. I said, I said, man, I, I said, I won't judge you. He said, okay, let me think about it. So it's bugging me all week. I'm like, what is the big secret, Charlie's secret? So the next week he walks in and I go shake his hand. I said, you ready to tell me that secret? He said, oh, man. I said, I said yeah, after service, I'll tell you. So we went through the service and I grabbed him after the service. I took him in the back room and usually a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, all of a sudden, it changed. The atmosphere got super, super intense. And he put his head down, and he wouldn't look at me. I said, what's up, man? I said, you can tell me anything. He said, I was going to commit suicide. And then he looked up at me eyeball to eyeball, and he said, when I say that I was going to commit suicide, he said, I really was going to commit suicide. I had no hope. He said, I had letters written to my parents. He said, I picked out a spot on the Coronado Bridge. He said, I had a date and I had a time picked out. It was a Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, about two months ago, I got a text message about noon asking me if I would come check out this new church called Worship Central, Pastor Brian Ming. He said, I put it off, and I decided that I was going to go to church that night. And he said, that was my first time to worship Central. <laughs> After he told me that, I, I, <clears throat> I can't tell you. It still grips my heart because when I think about my actions, laying in bed next to my wife saying, God, why is this happening? Are you trying to kill me? My three children, do you realize, God, that everything that I'm facing affects them? They're starting new schools. I have to put food on the table for them. Do you realize how hard this is? Did we miss it? Why is this so hard? I went home that night. I, 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 I hugged my wife, and we wept. We said, never again. Will we ever think those thoughts? God, why are you doing this? Did I miss it? Why am I here? Because here's the bottom line. If no other reason, if, we, if the church never even, never even got off the ground, God used us to reach one guy. And had we not come, had we not taken the step of faith, had we not come out and done what God wanted us to do and fought the good fight and not quit, Charlie would not even be on the planet right now or serving God. Thanks, God. Thanks, God. Thanks, God, for choosing me. Thanks, God, for sending me here and there. And thanks, God, for not just the good things, but the difficult things. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe you're in a place today and you're wondering, God, what is going on? Why is all this happening? Let me tell you, do not lose it. Do not, just know this. Know this. God's plans are good for you. He's not trying to kill you. He, I know it's difficult. There's, there's trying situations. We all go through it. You will have persecution. You will have trials. That's just as much a promise as any others. But... 
I will be with you every step of the way. I will stand with you. You will not fail when you trust in me. Be thankful. Know that I am your God. I will bring you through. And in the midst of it, thanks, God. Thanks, God, for choosing me to reach Charlie. Thanks, God. I want to close out in prayer, and I'm going to turn it back to Pastor. But I just want to say, I know for many this is an, a message that is challenging and, and encouraging, but I believe that there are a few in this place that you desperately needed. God sent me all the way from San Diego to remind you, don't become familiar. Don't become too familiar. Don't become bitter. Don't become restless. It's worth it. Be thankful. The prodigal son or the other son, you've been in church all your life. Maybe, you're, maybe you walk into this new building and it feels different. You're like, I don't even know if I belong here anymore. No, no, don't, don't, don't let those thoughts even come into your mind. God is moving here. God is working. There are good things happening. The growth. I, I to, spoke over Pastor um, yesterday and the team. I said, I just believe God has huge plans. He's going to do so many amazing things. God is setting this church up to be a beacon of hope in this entire region. You get to be a part of it. Thanks, God. Thanks, God. It's not easy to cry, cry of sacrifice and giving and sacrificing and serving. But thanks, God, that you would choose me to be used. It's like Joyce Myers, I heard her say. She said, many times we ask God, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. And then he uses us and we feel used. Thanks, God. Thanks, God, that you would choose me. So with every head bowed, every eye closed in this place, maybe you're in this place and this is like water to your soul. Maybe this is like the, the word that you needed for this year. This year, choose to be thankful. This year, choose. Choose the presence of God. Moses said it this way. He said, if the presence of God doesn't go, I'm not going. Come on, maybe make that decision internally. Decide today, I'm not going. The doorway to the presence of God, the pathway that you get to the presence of God is thanksgiving. I'm going to be thankful in any and every situation, no matter what. Thanks, God. If you're in this place and you say, Brian, you're speaking my lingo. God is using this message to, to challenge, encourage my heart to, to be more thankful and to, 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 to embrace maybe even some of the difficult things I'm going through. And you just say, hey, I want you to remember me in this prayer. I want to pray for you this morning. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up right now on the count of three. One, two, three, if that's you. Hands going up all over. Come on, be... Be honest. Be nobody looking around. It's just you and God. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Thanks, God. Lord, I pray for every person that raised their hands. I thank you, God, that you are so faithful. We thank you, God. Not just in the good times, but the difficult times, too. Strengthen those that are weary. Don't become weary in well-doing. For in due season, just know that God will send the harvest. He's not forgotten you. So we make this decision to be thankful and to be, to follow your presence every step this year. We just ask a blessing. I ask a blessing over every household, over this church, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So much, Brian. Appreciate, appreciate the word. I'm thankful for your message today. It's so important that we remain thankful. That's where we've been designed that. I don't know if you realize that, but we're designed to be thankful. And when we're not, it actually does damage to our own psyche, does damage to our own bodies. So it's just an opportunity. I want to give an opportunity to, um, first of all, maybe you come here today, and uh, I don't know where you are with God, but I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. You know that Jesus loves you? He really does. He loves you no matter what you've been through. God died for you. And he loves you. And he's, he's made, you're made for him. 
And until you give your life to Jesus, you're never going to have it right because you're designed by God for God. And until you give your life to God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. So I just want to give us a quick prayer for you this morning. And if you want to join with me and mean it from your heart, it can be the beginning of a new journey. You don't have to have it all together. He has it all together for you. You can't save yourself. No one's good enough, but he's good enough. So if you want to pray this prayer and you mean it from your heart, it's a new beginning. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you died on the cross for me. You paid the price for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And this day, Lord, I give my life to you. I say that you are my boss. You are my Lord. I surrender my desire to control, and I let you have control. Fill me and help me to walk the way you have for me today. And by your help, I pursue you from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe it's a new beginning. It's a beginning. I'm going to ask some of the prayer team. You all stand. We're going to have, actually, sit. That's fine. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. And Brian's going to share a closing song today. I always like to give an opportunity to, to bless when people come. There's no, no obligation obligated. No obligation to anyone here to do this, but we want to give a special gift to him today and, and, and bless him and his wife. And we appreciate what God is doing in them as they launch out in ministry and doing what they're doing. So we want to go ahead and do that. Father, I ask you to bless this special gift for him today, Lord. We just thank you for, for Brian and, and Kristen and, and her family. We thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you for the transparency and the authenticity that he has. God, it's so refreshing to meet people that are real and are, are about you, not about themselves. God, thank you for connecting us with him and his family. We ask you to bless them as they continue to move forward in what you have for them in Jesus' name. Amen. This thing will go completely for them. Go ahead. I'm going to ask my wife to sing this. And I basically went before the Lord and I asked him this question. I said, God, if you had a microphone and we're standing on the stage and could say one thing to humanity, what would it be? Went over to the piano and God gave me this song in a matter of five minutes. And I believe it's God's heart for the world today.
We want to continue to leave these open if you need prayer for anything at all. Otherwise, we want to dismiss you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. And we look forward to seeing you tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to have a great time of worship. God bless you guys.